Welcome to uh, our event on the impact and legacy of Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, brought to you by the School of Foreign Service with an illustrious panel of colleagues uh, and also um, sponsored through our grant with the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Uh, as saddened as I am by the death of Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, uh, I'm delighted to have this array of SFS colleagues here with me uh, to share their reflections on Mikhail Gorbachev, on the tremendous impact that he had in his work and in his life, um, and also uh, to draw on their own research and their own lived experience during the times of Perestroika and afterwards. We're very fortunate today to have experts from a range of subject areas. Uh, we will be hearing today first from our own SFS Dean, Joel Hellman, who uh, studied bankers and political economy in this time period, uh, followed by our uh, own Director Emerita and Professor Emerita at the Georgetown uh, Department of Government, Angela Stent, uh, Jill Doherty, a uh, longtime associate with Ceres, uh, CNN uh, bureau chief, formerly an expert on Russia. Uh, then Teresa Sabonis Health from the SFS's program on science, technology, and international affairs, who uh, of whom I have been jealous for several decades because I was doing my own dissertation research in Moscow in 1991 and went home in June. She was there for the August coup attempt, so a major historical event, which I missed. Uh, and last but not least, we have Dr. Maria Snegovaya, who is our Carnegie-funded postdoctoral fellow uh, at Ceres. So welcome listeners and panelists. We are gonna start with Dean Hellman. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, and it's great to be here with uh, so many people who have such a deep knowledge and understanding and engagement of, uh, of Russia, the Soviet period as well, um, and I'm eager to hear from them. Uh, I just really want to start off first by kind of commending you for um, putting this together. Um, I, look, there's no doubt that Gorbachev is one of the major figures um, of, uh, the, of the last, really literally the last century. Um, you know, an individual um, with um, who is truly transformative in in reshaping the global arena. Um, he certainly didn't reshape it according to a strategy or clear vision of where it was going to go, but the results of the what he set in motion um, changed the face of the global order, um, shaped and created the post Cold War order, which has decisively ended so recently. Um, and, and he just has to be seen as a major historical and global figure. I need, though, to start with a personal, uh, just a personal note. Um, and I, I suspect that uh, others here might, may have um, their engagement, not necessarily with Mikhail Sergeyevich, um, although I suspect uh, um, uh, Angela and Jill will have had uh, stories of dealing with him directly. Um, but I want to tell a slightly different story because it, it just says something about the moment in which he came to power. Um, I uh, was a graduate student at, uh, at Oxford University in 1985 when Mikhail Sergeyevich became General Secretary of the Communist Party. Um, and uh, I, I was a great believer at the time that, uh, in, in, that we needed to go much more deeply in our understanding of the Soviet Union, not take everything for face value through kind of standard Cold War lenses. And so I read seriously, not necessarily with a criminological lens, but you know, took seriously the writings um, in the journals, um, in the social science journals and the political science journals um, that existed at the time. And for those of us who were reading these rather bland um, journals, there was uh, the set of new ideas that were bubbling up in the early years of, of Gorbachev's leadership. Um, they were phrased at the time, this was prior to Pitestroika and Glasnost, they were phrased as novia muslimia. Um, and uh, there were figures like Fyodor Berlatsky, um, uh, Georgi Shachnazarov, and others who were writing in specialized political science uh, journals um, uh, and they were writing uh, what seemed like 
a very, very significant, indeed even radical departure um, from existing Soviet thinking. Um, and they were all based on kind of core social science concepts trying to link together our understanding of politics in the Soviet space with politics and political science more generally. And I took this very seriously, and I started to write papers as a graduate student on this Novaya Muslimia. Um, nobody was really working on it at the time, um, and, uh, but it was bubbling, starting to bubble up, and people were starting to notice it. So I, I was invited from England um, as a graduate student, um, uh, because I was the only one working on it. I was invited by someone I bet Angela knows quite well, Fritz Ermarth. Um, who was at the time the head of the National Intelligence Council. Um, and he had a Saturday meeting. Um, I think it was on a Saturday because he didn't think that it was worth a weekday um, to discuss, um, in which I think he felt compelled to kind of bring the few people together who were thinking about what was bubbling up in the Soviet space. Um, and I came as a young graduate student to present my paper on the Novia Mushlinia. And, and uh, I presented my paper and Fritz Ermart sort of stops in the middle, stops me in the middle and says, this is what the problem is with this next generation. Um, they, they feed and they buy into this propaganda um, that the Soviet Union creates to dupe younger generations into letting our guard down um, and, un, and misunderstanding the true threat the Soviet Union places on us. And this is so dangerous, and I just want to ref, you know, reflect on how dangerous it is that our best young students are working on this. I see this as a time at the time because it just suggests how you know radical a break it eventually became, how 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 little we in the United States in particular were ready to sort of see um, what eventually would become, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the collapse of the Soviet order. It was unimaginable uh, at the time. Um, it was seen as bubbling up as a, uh, you know, as an effort to kind of get us off our guard and just another in a long sort of series of efforts to dupe us into misunderstanding the true threat. Um, and it just reminds us what a radical departure um, he began and also reminds us that it was actually rooted in, in, in thinking that was bubbling up from within the system. And I think that's the core aspect of, of Gorbachev, that he was uh, you know, a within system uh, reformer who obviously eventually toppled the very system that he was you know, so much a product of. And that the ideas that he was generating were not necessarily ideas from the outside. Obviously they were influenced by Western literature. They were interested by Western social science. People like Burlatsky and Shachnazarov were, were reading Western journals and Western debates, but they really were rooted in these ideas that are coming out about how to expand the system. And so I, I, I say that story because it suggests where Gorbachev came from as a reformer. It suggests how little prepared we were for an understanding of what was ahead when he took over power. Um, and it suggests what, you know, a, a kind of how, how um, remarkable um, uh, what he eventually set in motion was. So let me leave it at that um, and, and hear from um, the much wiser heads <laughs> um, here in this, uh, in this forum who, you know, really spent um, uh, so many years engaging and working um, uh, on the Soviet Union that he uh, eventually saw um, the decline of. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. Appreciate it. We're going to turn the floor over to Angela. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Joel, for your remarks. I can just hear Fritz Ermoth saying that to you. And I can imagine the expression on his face when he did. Uh, so like Dean Hellman, I'm gonna start off also on a personal note. Uh, in 1996, I interviewed Mikhail Sergeyevich for my book that I was writing on German unification. Uh, he was of course out of power then. I went to the Gorbachev Foundation uh, and we sat in a very nicely paneled room and spoke. Um, and it is true that I would ask him a question and then an hour later, he'd still be answering the same question. Um, um, he was talkative, he was warm, um, and he also sort of told me at that point that ever since 1956, really, with the secret speech, he'd known that there was something wrong with the system. But obviously, as Dean Helmers has said, he was part of the system. He was an ideological secretary and then in charge of agriculture at the end before he became general secretary. So he really was in the system. Um, but I want to just read you a couple of things he told me then, because I'm going to talk about 
Gorbachev's foreign policy uh, and what he told me about Western leaders that he'd met with. And he said to me that Ronald Reagan was the greatest Western statesman that he dealt with, that he had vision, that he had imagination, that both of them were committed to ridding the world of nuclear weapons. Um, and he said President Reagan was far-sighted enough to respond to our initiatives on arms control. Again, he said that he was the one who took the initiative and then President Reagan responded to it. I think if you talk to the people in the Reagan administration, they'd say something different, but we know that together they did uh, discuss this. And then he said um, none of the presidents who came after Reagan had the vision or foresight um, on these matters. And then he said, uh, coming back to the issue with Margaret Thatcher, uh, that his second favorite Western leader was Margaret Thatcher, that they were ideologically, of course, very different, but he really enjoyed debating with her on how intelligent she was um, and um, that she was also a woman of vision. Um, and then the, the leader about whom he was really lukewarm was Helmut Kohl, the chancellor of Germany at the time of German unification. And when I talked to Gorbachev, Germany was the largest donor by far um, uh, to Russia and before that the Soviet Union in gratitude for German unification. And what he didn't like about Helmut Kohl was, you know, he criticized the Helmut Boris diplomacy, sauna diplomacy. He didn't like the fact that the German chancellor, of course, at that point enjoyed a fairly close relationship with uh, Boris Yeltsin, and he did say, coming back to what uh, Dean Hellman was saying, that new political thinking was needed again in the 1990s. Um, anyway, it was it was quite a, a revealing interview. Um, so I think the thing about Gorbachev's legacy, if we're talking about foreign policy, is that the further west you go away from today's Russia, the more popular he is. Um, he's very popular in parts of Western Europe, particularly Germany still, and the United States. Um, and I think it was very interesting to watch the reaction uh, to his death and then how the funeral was conducted. I'm sure others of you will talk about it more. Uh, we know he remains a highly polarizing figure in Russia. And in fact, he was barely dead when some of the, these terrible political commentators started hurling uh, insults at him. But I was struck uh, by the thousands of people who did line up, uh, young as well as older, um, who wanted to, to view the body, uh, who wanted to pay their respects to him. And I do think that it's shocking, although not surprising, that Vladimir Putin did not show up to the funeral and that Gorbachev did not have uh, a state funeral. Um, but again, it's not surprising because if, as Putin has said, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, in his view, is the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, then obviously you're not going to pay your respects to the man who unwittingly uh, was responsible for it. Um, so his, Gorbachev's foreign policy legacy mainly, uh, it consists of what I would call the intentional parts of it, which is the warming of ties with the West, uh, improving ties with the United States, focusing on arms control. If you think about it, uh, the Soviet Union, the United States together actually got rid of an entire class of nuclear weapons with the INF Treaty, something that hadn't been done before. Um, and of course, they did talk about shocking their aides that they wanted to rid the world of nuclear weapons by the year 2000. But they were both very committed to arms control and they did make the world between them uh, and particularly Gorbachev a much safer place. And it's sad to say when you look at that legacy, the INF Treaty, of course, no longer exists. The Trump administration pulled out of it, and then the Russians did too. Um, and now you have really uh, the beginnings of uh, a major new arms race between the United States and Russia. And it's not clear that the New START Treaty in 2026 will be replaced by something else, uh, dealing with strategic nuclear weapons. So this is an element of Gorbachev's legacy that, alas, his successors um, have really um, rejected and, and put aside. Um, now, I do want to stress that some of his policy in terms of improving ties with the West, and this goes back to something that Dean Hellman was saying, it wasn't well thought out and it wasn't well prepared. He did not come to power uh, wanting to see the Soviet bloc break up, and he didn't come to power wanting to see the Soviet Union break up. But he did nothing to prevent it. He allowed all of these forces in Eastern Europe to run their course and for Eastern Europe to break free. And he did allow German unification, which is why he's still so popular there. But when I was talking to an American diplomat who 
participated in the two plus four talks that uh, negotiated uh, German unification. He said to me, we were very lucky that the Soviets never got their act together. And if you talk to people about those months in 1990, between September and December, essentially, the intense period of negotiations, Soviet delegates would come to the meetings really with no instructions. Um, and I think it just shows you that, that by that point, uh, with Eastern Europe slipping away, uh, there really weren't any plans, there weren't clear instructions for any of them, and things were kind of uh, falling apart. Um, now, um, in terms of the, and so this really was the unintended part of his foreign policy, um, allowing all of this to happen and, and allowing Eastern Europe to break free. Um, and that is why even most Central and East European countries are grateful towards him. Um, obviously, they're parts of the former Soviet Union, the Baltic states, particularly Armenia, Azerbaijan, that have a rather different view of Gorbachev, and that was pretty clear um, after he died in the comments, because of the use of violence uh, in these places as the Soviet Union was disintegrating. Um, and I do recall when Gorbachev came uh, to the United States after the Soviet collapse, he was asked at the Library of Congress, what was your biggest mistake? And he said, I underestimated the nationalities question. Uh, and that I think is a, an understatement. Uh, he, I think like many of his fellow Politburo members and people in the Soviet nomenclatura really didn't understand how much most of the non-Russian ethnic republics. And I would put an exception here with Central Asia and I'll be interested to hear what Professor Sabonis Health says, uh, but uh, most, most of the non-ethnic Russian republics wanted to break free and he really didn't understand that. And um, that's of course um, why the Soviet Union collapsed. And then two final words just on the unintentional and the, and the intentional domestic parts of his legacy. So Glasnost and Perestroika and Novia Mishlenia were intentional and they were very important. I agree with Dean Hellman. The new political thinking was crucial as a precursor to many of these things that happened afterwards. And the Glasnost um, certainly was. And if you just think about it, just compare the debates uh, in the Congress of People's Deputies in the late 1980s and 90s with the debates in the current Duma. I mean, the Soviet Union in the last few years of Gorbachev was much freer uh, than Putin's Russia is today. And the fact that historians, scholars could examine the dark pages of history, which Gorbachev allowed them to do, uh, the most neuralgic parts, Katyn, the Nazi Soviet pact, all of those things. And that's of course completely gone now. Uh, it's very difficult for any Russian historian today to write honestly about that period of time and about other periods in history. That was all very important and a lot of that is lost. The perestroika didn't work out so well. He was very inconsistent in the economic reforms. He vacillated between uh, more liberal reforms and then listening to the, the people who wanted to retain uh, the, the state control of the system. He was unlucky because oil prices were so low. So the economic part of it, as we know, really wasn't very successful. Um, but I would say the, the other parts are. So I think when we look at the legacy today, it may take a very long time before people can fully digest what his legacy was, but we can say that he was one of those rare moments in the thousand years of Russian history when autocracy did give way to greater pluralism, to greater questioning, to greater freedom for the people who live in that space. And we just don't know when that will come again. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Angela. I too am feeling a lot of nostalgia for Glasnost, and I think that's the perfect uh, segue to hand the floor uh, to Jill. Okay, thank you very much, um, both to Joel and to uh, Angela. And it looks like there's a theme emerging, which is this, you know, intentional, non-intentional. Uh, my job is to talk about Glasnost. And uh, I was just thinking, especially as Joel was speaking, you know, when you think about um, perestroika, I, I, probably a lot of that, you know, the idea might have been intentional, but a lot of the way it was carried out was not. But in Glasnost, I think you do have Gorbachev, who really had a vision of what he wanted to do, which was to open society. And, you know, the even the very word Glasnost, when I think of that period, I think of um, excitement. I mean, I, I, I'll give you a little bit of background. I started 
um, in journalism, to actually in 1972 at the Voice of America, the uh, Golos Amerike uh, USSR division as a Russian language broadcaster. And I remember those times, you know, 72, when they were jamming the broadcasts of, the, of VOA and other broadcasts that came from the West. And then I transported myself because I've been thinking a lot about Gorbachev. I had to do a lot of live shots for CNN recently about this. And thinking of that period in the 80s when he came in and the absolute ferment that people went through at the time. There were publications and debates and, and just this uh, excitement of being able to question things. You know, Angela was talking about um, uh, the dark parts of Russian, of, of Soviet history. And that is definitely true. And I, I actually have a list that I wanna go through, but just to finish this, um, I think if you look at it technically, let's say for a glassness, publications, opening up, et cetera, that is definitely revolutionary. And I will go through some of those, but I think there was another value for Gorbachev and that is the personal. You know, Gorbachev, I met him numerous times. Um, he was a little bit before my time because I went to Russia. I went in the 80s for CNN because I started with CNN in 83. But really, by 91, I was working at the White House. And during the 80s, I was in the United States. So I didn't really cover him directly. But certainly when I came to Moscow from 91 on and then as a bureau chief in 97, we would talk to Gorbachev quite, quite frequently because he had views about many things that were happening. And when Angela said he would be talking for a long time, that is true. As a journalist, I can tell you that you only had to ask one question of, of, of President Gorbachev and he would you know, probably talk for an hour in a fascinating way and giving you more than you ever expected, but it was not very hard to get a very interesting conversation going with him. But I would say the personal was very, very important. Not only he as an individual who was uh, one of my heroes uh, on, for many, on a many bases. And I think one of them was that he allowed people to be people you know, that word, many Russians, went, after he died, referred to him as a chelodek, you know, a person, a human being, which people in the Soviet Union had a tough time being unless they were at home in their kitchens. And that he was able to, you know, talk about his love for Raisa, talk about his human emotions and go out to people. That was extraordinarily valuable. So I just wanted to... Um, go through some of the um, the utter transformation that occurred under Gorbachev. And not to get too into today, I would say the stunning, stunning loss of media freedom under Vladimir Putin. And I say that with great sadness. So um, I, I just recently became upon a timeline that I found extremely helpful, and I would recommend it to anyone. It was done in 2015 by Natalia Rastova, who is, uh, the, was a Wilson Center Kennan Institute scholar, and she put together a list, which is fascinating. If you can just Google it and you will find it, a, um, a timeline of what Gorbachev did during those short six years. So I went through that literally, you know, day by day, month by month. And I'll go through some of the headlines because I think some of us actually experienced that. And for people who didn't, this is really, it will open your mind to what he was really doing. So he comes in, you know, as a, um, as the, uh, General Secretary of the Communist Party in 85. And I noticed from the beginning, if you want to kind of uh, have big areas where he worked, one was opening to the world. And so very quickly, one of the first things he did in May of 85, a telebridge between San Diego and Moscow on World War II. And telebridges at that point, of course, now we'd have Zooms, but at that point it was actually a, you know, a live TV broadcast. 
where citizens in the United States and Russia could talk with each other. And then after that telebridge, uh, he gave the first interview to the Western media, to Time Magazine. The, he started in November, the presidents greeted each other for New Year's, which was also revolutionary. And then my favorite in uh, June of 1986, Phil Donahue and the Soviet Union, that wonderful telebridge in which the uh, one Soviet citizen, a, an, a woman of a certain age, said that they did not have sex in the Soviet Union, which of course you can look that up and find out that they actually did have sex in the Soviet Union, but that's another story. So um, just as important, I think he opened the minds of his fellow citizens to uh, by ending censorship and allowing freedom of expression. So as he comes into office, he immediately goes out into the hinterland and he is talking with people, he's shaking their hands, he's listening to them, getting information. And I would say that Raisa was very important. You know, she had, she was a, quite a scholar and studied sociology. And she herself had been, you know, mucking around literally in her boots, talking with people in the countryside when she was doing her research and finding out what was on their minds. So Gorbachev does kind of the same thing, going out to the people and speaking to them. Uh, he traveled to many cities. And then the next thing that he did was to transform the Soviet media. And he began one by one to remove the old hoary uh, Soviet bureaucrats and bringing in new heads, in, in, actually into the propaganda department of the Central Committee, Alexander Yakovlev, and then new editors. And I, here's some of the list, Novaya Avremia, Aganyok, Moskovsky Novosti, uh, Novi Mir, they all had new editors that came in who transformed them. And then there were new shows. And this is one period where I was watching when, whenever I was there, and I, I would go back in the 80s, uh, new shows were really amazing. The 12th Floor, um, Club Vysolich i Nachotchivich, you know, the uh, Club of Jolly and Resourceful, in which people could actually talk about what they were thinking, and especially young people could. Uh, there was uh, Before and After Midnight, there was Zgliad, which is really one of the, the key programs at that time. And um, then a film that to me was the beginning. The door was opened and then it was quickly shot, but that film was called Pakayanya, Repentance. And that was repentance, the, the beginning of the process of settling with the past and what had happened under Stalin. That did not go very far, uh, unfortunately. And we could, it's another, of course, subject, but I do think if they had continued Pakayanya, we would not be in the position where we are right now. Then you had the return of political people. Sakharov uh, was, uh, you know, comes out publicly finally in 1986. Uh, they had an article by him to tell the truth. It is absolutely uh, necessary. That was in Moscow News. And these, again, the, the ferment of those of the discussion that that engendered at that time. Then you had forbidden writers going way back to the poet uh, Nikolai Gumelyov, you know, uh, Rybakov, Children of the Arbat, Anna Akhmatova, Zoshinka, um, and then of course, ar uh, the archipelago Gulag, archipelago Gulag that came out. I would say that with the period of Chernobyl was not a high point of Glasnost because they did not admit, Gorbachev did not admit what was going on in Chernobyl, but eventually they did. But I would say that was a low point where the old inst instinct to cover up came forward. But onward, they ended in uh, 1988, ended jamming of foreign broadcasts, Western publications were being sold in Moscow, and then they ended censorship and introduced ethics for journalists. Uh, and you had um, more events, you know, some big, uh, more recent Echo Moscow Radio began broadcasting in 1990. Nizadisima Gazeta was founded in 1990. 
VC, which now of course is unwatchable, but that went on the air in 91. And then the coup coverage, which CNN had a lot to do with in 91. Um, then I, the last one would be, as we were watching the funeral for Gorbachev, one of the main people there was uh, Dmitry Muratov, who of course is with uh, Novaya Gazeta, which was founded by, partially with the help of Mikhail Gorbachev. So I don't want to dwell on today, but it is, um, to me, it was really stunning. I literally sat there reading that list and thinking, how could he have done all of that in six years? And then of course, how could be undone so quickly after that? But maybe I'll stop there and I'm sure there are a lot of things we can discuss and questions, thank you. Thank you, Jill. I was thinking the same thing as you thought, that this past 12 months is not just the death of Gorbachev, but the liquidation of Memorial, the shuttering of Novaya Gazeta. It's, it's, it's the end of perestroika in a way, right? The remnants even of perestroika. So um, yeah, very sad set of not coincidental <laughs> actions that happened this year. All right, um, let me turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Savonis Health. Thanks, Terry. Thanks. So I was asked to speak about energy and about regional challenges. And with your comment that, that uh, this really represents the end of perestroika, I want to begin with talking a little bit about energy, because I would argue um, that decisions Russia has taken in the past two months represent the end of what perestroika was trying to do in energy. Gorbachev came to power with a profound understanding. Um, <laughs> Thane Gustafson, our own Georgetown um, scholar, wrote a lot about this, but um, he came to power with an understanding that because the Soviet Union had been self-sufficient in energy, it missed the 1970s. The energy shocks and the crises that hit Europe and the United States did not touch the Soviet Union. And so all the innovations in making energy more efficient, in thinking about energy intensity as something you should care about, missed the Soviet Union. And then as energy became more and more important to the economy of the Soviet Union, the fact that they used it themselves so poorly became more and more an issue. And in fact, in the late five, in the late five-year plans of the party, Getting better at exploiting and managing energy was a huge priority of Gorbachev's Soviet Union. Um, and that gets me to my personal connection, uh, which is I worked in the mid 1980s in a think tank in Colorado called the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is considered the premier institute on energy efficiency. And Gorbachev had engaged our institute to work to start looking at what were the ways that the Soviet Union could become more energy efficient. Um, and at the time I was a very junior scholar and was not invited to any of those really cool trips. Um, but as time went on and Gorbachev's own domestic support was becoming more and more problematic, he took two double hatting ministers. So a minister who was responsible for one thing would suddenly also become the minister of something else. And when the Minister of Energy became the Minister of Education, he reached out to the Rocky Mountain Institute and asked if we would run an exchange program for young people on energy issues. And as a junior person who didn't have any idea how hard it was gonna to be to do that, um, I was suckered into um, doing that. And so I ran an exchange in 1988 in Tbilisi and, um, and Colorado. Um, but the fascinating thing about that set of energy challenges is that I really do believe that Gorbachev and a, an elite cadre of technocrats really understood how profound the problem was. But because selling energy, and as the price of energy was low, it was urgent to sell more and more, um, the emphasis of trying to save the Soviet economy by exporting more and more really pulled away from beginning to use it more rationally at home. And the reason why in energy, I, I concur that we're looking at a death of perestroika is that there really was an effort to make that export relationship uh, very carefully preserve it, to expand it, and to really um, 
link that tightly. And of course, the low energy prices made it especially difficult because in an era of Glasnost, as marvelous as it is to re-explore your history and to give people an opportunity to speak, when the economy is in terrible condition, what people want to speak about is usually not very supportive um, of, of the system that is or the people who are in power. Um, I do think Gorbachev theoretically got energy right, although was unable to implement it. Chernobyl was one piece of the problem. Remember, Chernobyl occurred very early in his administration. Um, it brought down enormous amounts of Western uh, criticism. There was no treaty at that time that compelled the Soviet Union to tell anyone that there had been a nuclear accident. That treaty simply did not exist because in a Cold War environment it had been impossible to put one forward. Although the Soviet Union was very slow in admitting what had happened, um, they did become very willing and engaged in the international treaties and agreements about nuclear accidents. And so I would say that Chernobyl began an era of international nuclear energy cooperation, although throughout the entire time to the present, the Russians have always felt that the West's real concerns about Soviet design were combined with a desire for more market share and, and pushing back the Russian Soviet designs. So there was always, there's always been some real tension in nuclear energy. But I wanna turn now away from the energy issue um, and use my remaining five minutes to talk about the regional issue. Um, it's a great question and, and Bill Courtney reprises it in the Q and A of how did Gorbachev miss the incredible inflammatory nature of the nationalist question. And I can only give you a partial answer. And again, I'll fall back a little bit on some personal anecdote. But recall that the first major crisis, which could be understood as an ethnic problems from the provinces, um, actually came in December 86, so very early in Gorbachev's administration. And that was the riots in Almaty. Uh, when in an effort to clean up corruption, Gorbachev wanted to remove local power and bring in outside power. Um, this ended in riots and a shift in policy to make sure that Central Asians, the face of Central Asia was well represented in Central Asian governance. Um, but following on that, um, what we saw, first of all, going back to Chernobyl, Chernobyl contaminated everyone because when they sent the brigades to try to put out the fires, the construction of the Soviet military was such that every republic had some young people represented. And so every republic got these young people back, some of them um, in fairly serious health circumstances, some of them not, but in every country of the former Soviet Union, there is to this day a program to monitor and give assistance to the liquidators. So that was something that touched everyone. And remember now what we had. In December of 88, we had the Armenian earthquake. Um, Karabakh, the first petitions to shift responsibility for Karabakh away from Azerbaijan and to Armenia um, began in February of 88. Um, we saw the, um, the Georgia riots that were met with the use of deadly force in April of 89. And so what we saw were continuous problems that could have looked as if they were individual, but brought together, they were, um, they were really important. What we need to remember here is that, uh, that Stalin was the great um, mad, if you will, the mad demographer. He drew the borders of the Republic such that there was an ethnic minority in every Republic. And the theory of that was you needed to have a group that wanted Moscow, that needed Moscow's help to feel safe so that you would always have that it's a very classic colonial strategy. But as the center became weaker and weaker, this colonial strategy brought in a lot of seeds of destruction. Um, and what we saw were um, increasingly um, tensions inside the countries, but we also saw a lot more dynamism in the countries than we saw in Moscow, with the exception of Central Asia. So I just want to remind you that in January 91, Lithuania declared independence. Whether Gorbachev authorized the use of force against them or not remains a little bit contentious, but force was used against them. They rescinded their declaration. By May of 91, Georgia declared independence and braced for troops, and no troops came. 
So Georgia still counts its Independence Day as May because they declared independence and no consequences fell to them. And what we saw was all the way until August, most of the other republics stayed inside the, Union, the Soviet Union. Things began to fall apart in August. But the interesting thing to Angela's earlier point is that um, the Central Asian republics did not leave the Soviet Union. They were thrown out. Um, there was a series of discussions among the great Russians, the Belarusians, the Ukrainians, and the Russians, with Yeltsin in a leadership role, in which they decided that the poor ethnic groups, especially the ones who were Muslim and growing in population, were pulling resources away from the Union, and that a great Union of white Russians was preferable to a Union that included everyone. Um, the, um, the former president of Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev, was actually the chief negotiator between Gorbachev and Yeltsin, trying to keep the Soviet Union together. Um, so when I look at my two regions, Central Asia and the Caucasus, it's really quite extraordinary because the Caucasus were struggling very hard to get out, and the Central Asians were really quite reluctant to leave and couldn't re figure out why Gorbachev was such a dangerous and liberal reformer. Um, but I think that one of the reasons why Gorbachev did not understand the ethnicities question is because he had, uh, in some part, it is Nazarbayev. I think he was working most closely with representatives of minority groups that did not wish to leave the union. Um, with the exception of Shevardnadze, and Shevardnadze, of course, is seen as something of a traitor in, in, in Georgia. But it's a very curious, we can't imagine that all republics were equally eager to leave. Some wanted concessions, some wanted to be free to continue to rip off the center, some were in a desperate hurry to leave. And because there was such a difference, the strength of their institutions mattered enormously, but the strength of their preferences was really unclear. Thank you, Terry. I think you packed two full lectures into 10 minutes, so hats off. <laughs> and some important uh, reminders, too, of, of, of when sovereignty started, including uh, for Russia in June of 1991, uh, before the August coup. Um, before we move to our final speaker, I just want to remind listeners that you can pose your questions by writing using the Q&A feature on Zoom, and I will be picking some uh, to ask to our panel um, once we hear from Dr. Snegovaya. Maria, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really honored uh, to be presenting uh, among such esteemed uh, participants. Uh, so for me, of course, the uh, personal angle with Gorbachev is less pronounced since uh, most of my adult life in uh, Russia was spent in later years when he was already not in power. Uh, however, I think it's also very important to highlight the role that Gorbachev and attitudes towards Gorbachev uh, represents in today's society and how my um, compatriots essentially view uh, his position. Because as I argue, this is quite reflective of some of the choices, some of the orientations uh, that the Russian society has made, has taken. Uh, so first of all, as it's been mentioned before uh, by previous speakers, uh, Gorbachev remains a highly uh, polarizing person. Uh, we've seen a commentary uh, to his death ranging from him being a Judah, a traitor, as presenting by the hawkish, uh, maybe left side of the political spectrum, all the way to liberator, you know, the beacon of hope, a person who uh, gave Russia freedoms. Uh, unfortunately, if you ask uh, the majority of Russians, based on the polls, keeping in mind the limitations of polls in autocratic uh, settings, we do see the majority would side with the former vision. Um, and interestingly enough, these attitudes towards Gorbachev, uh, they remain fairly unchanged pretty much early on since 1990s and particularly since, since early 2000s. Uh, the society has shaped uh, its attitudes towards Gorbachev as fundamentally having done bad things uh, for Russia, uh, Levada, for example, shows that since 2002, approximately 20% of respondents say that Gorbachev rather had a negative, uh, played a negative role in Russia's recent history, and only uh, two to three percent have estimated his contribution as positive. Two to three percent. Uh, general attitude towards perestroika. Uh, 
uh, is even more radical. Uh, here, the majority of respondents, 66% of respondents believe that perestroika period was rather bad bad or rather bad for Russia, and only 20% uh, believed, which I think sharply corresponds to the share of Russians who share pro-liberal views in the society, only 20% uh, tended to say that uh, it was rather positive. Uh, it's also possible, there's actually more people are negative about the perestroika, the transition period, than uh, the number of people who are negative about Gorbachev, and that's because uh, likely, um, according to the polls, many people think that Gorbachev may, be, may have meant well, but his actions have overall uh, delivered bad consequences overall. Interestingly for me, uh, as my uh, adult years in Russia was spent primarily in the circles of Russia's uh, pro-market liberal reformers um, of Yeltsin's time. So for me, there was always this sharp division uh, drawn uh, between Yeltsin and Gorbachev, or Gorbachev liberating, but without necessarily knowing where it was going to end up, and Yeltsin uh, with, with a more clear, uh, perhaps, strategy in mind, but also having made a lot of mistakes. That is not the case uh, for majority of Russians. Currently, the public opinion sort of lumps Gorbachev and Yeltsin together, both of them having essentially contributed to, rather contributed to the wrong uh, direction uh, that the country has taken during the, uh, this period. And of course, that's hardly surprising, uh, knowing everything that was going on, the state propaganda and the collective, like the general change uh, in the Russian society that's been uh, unraveling over the last uh, 20 years in particular, where uh, the past, particularly the Soviet past, became over the years crystallized as the only sort of ideal orientation of the society. And unfortunately, by year 2022, we see that this orientation towards the Soviet past among the broader society, of course, uh, translated into the uh, policies. A very unfortunate uh, dynamic in Ukraine and for uh, Russia more broadly. Uh, of course, this is the orientation that's primarily shared by older people, those uh, above 55 years old, low educated, and uh, those of lower income. Uh, but nonetheless, in general, that's the dominating mood in the society, and that's reflective of their take. That's also why uh, these beliefs on Gorbachev and Yeltsin's uh, dominate. Um, importantly, I'd point out that definitely state Laurent propaganda plays a huge role in this dimension, as Professor Stent and uh, Jill have emphasized. But the problem is also uh, that the, as I mentioned before, the attitudes toward Gorbachev and Yeltsin were formed pretty early on. Uh, so even around the time Putin came to power, in some ways you can argue uh, he was also reflecting some of the societal consensus that was shaping already back then. Now. This particular moment, uh, Gorbachev's death, of course, comes at the very gloomy uh, uh, period in Russia's history, which was by many Russian liberals, of course, interpreted as a very symbolic uh, moment uh, that at this right now that Russia is returning back and very obviously uh, abandoning its modernization uh, trajectory, we also see uh, Gorbachev passing. And this, of course, as Professor Stent actually emphasized, uh, also was reflected in the um, attitudes and the different uh, positions uh, and different, different sort of um, honor paid to Gorbachev by the officials, the absence of the state funeral, uh, no um, uh, Putin not showing up to in the, at the funeral, and as well as uh, significant reduction in the number of at the, at the timing uh, that would allow for the people to say goodbye uh, to Gorbachev and no speeches even, no public speeches were allowed during this time. Uh, simultaneously, you see the uh, re whatever remains of Russian civil society, pro-liberal, lib Russian liberals, um, also expressing their uh, reverence to Gorbachev in the, what was one called by one commentator, in the last available form of political protest, lining up um, in order to say uh, the last goodbye uh, to him. I thought it was very uh, symbolic in this sense. 
Uh, and last but not the least, uh, I got asked a lot uh, to comment on what was uh, General uh, Gorbachev's perspective on uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, notably, over his last years, he has repeatedly um, demonstrated his uh, dissatisfaction with Putin's policies. He actually spoke up against uh, repressions, against limitations of uh, freedoms over the last decade, uh, and even supported Belarus protests. Uh, however, he was also uh, quite a um, uh, you know, status man. He understood the rules of the game. So while, uh, according to Alexei Benediktov, uh, the former editor-in-chief of Echo of Moscow, Gorbachev was quite upset about uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, he only expressed that, uh, that frustration uh, privately. He never spoke up about it. And in this sense, I think this is also reflective of this current political moment. Even people of Gorbachev's posture uh, found it better to remain silent uh, rather than uh, to speak up against it. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I think that's really a great uh, spot to, to stop there with Gorbachev's silence or whether voluntary or semi-voluntary over the last few years. I'll say that when I asked my students uh, following Gorbachev's death the next day in class, you know, how they felt about it. Did they have any sort of like strong feelings about Gorbachev? Uh, they, several of them exclaimed, we thought he was dead already. So they were not aware, you know, that he was, uh, that he was still with us. And uh, that was painful uh, for me to hear because again, I think that he, was such a formative figure in the life of his country, but also for those of us who studied it because we directly benefited from that openness, from openness in the media and so forth. So we for certain uh, are gonna miss him regardless of whether we think he was a great leader or a somewhat hapless leader uh, or so forth. You know, it really, really is a transition for us um, to be without him and his political legacy. So once again, I'm gonna invite listeners uh, to put questions in the chat if they like. And I think that I will start us out um, giving uh, other panelists to have a chance to comment on this question from William Courtney about why Gorbachev did not have a good grasp on the nationalities question. And uh, he cites that um, a private conversation with Shepard Nadze where uh, he had asked Shepard Nadze why Gorbachev didn't understand this question. And Shepard Nadze responded with a twinkle that Gorbachev was too good of a communist. So I take that to mean that he thought that class mattered and not ethnicity. Um, but I am interested if other people want to chime in on that really important question about what escaped Gorbachev about uh, the nationalities questions. And you can just unmute yourself and chime in. I'll just begin. I mean, I was very interested in what uh, Teresa Bonus Health said about the fact that Gorbachev listened to people like Nazarbayev. Um, in other words, when he was talking to the leaders of the non Russian uh, republics and someone like Nazarbayev, who was already then, you know, an intermediary, uh, was kind of telling him one thing. And of course, as, as we've said, the Central Asian states didn't want independence, they had it thrust upon them. And so he may have been unduly influenced by that. On the other hand, you know, Chevron Nazi was his foreign minister uh, for, for several years. And Chevron Nazi was you know, he'd been a communist country, but he was also a Georgian nationalist. So you would have thought that some of that would have rubbed off or he would have understood that. Um, certainly if you talk to Americans who dealt with Chevron Nadze, particularly James Baker, you know, they very much understood that for Chevron Nadze, Georgia, you know, was his homeland and he, uh, and he was very uh, drawn to it. But I think probably also um, a number of commentators have said since Gorbachev died, he really did believe in the ideology of Marxism, Leninism, maybe not the way it had developed, um, you know, under Brezhnev, where there were obviously lots of problems. And in that sense, again, we, we come back to what you were saying, Kelly, um, it's class, not ethnicity. Um, and that, um, you know, the, and that Marxism, Leninism, the society in which you're trying to build transcends all of that. And therefore it was, it was a blind spot for him. Uh, 
Can I add, I, I just had one thing. Um, you know, what I, what I found interesting, and, and I, I still think to some extent uh, unwritten about the fall of the Soviet Union, was how little Gorbachev understood the Russian Federation, um, Russia, and the, and the government of the Russian Federation, because ultimately the collapse of the Soviet Union um, uh, was really kind of a function of the disintegration um, uh, of the Russian Federation from the Soviet Union, and which essentially you know, hollowed out um, uh, the, the, the Soviet Union. It couldn't exist without the Russian Federation. And so the, what, I, what I take from that is, it's not necessarily about the nationalities question, but he unleashed um, the energies of governance at, uh, at levels outside of the Politburo and, and, and the central institutions. And he just had no understanding of, of, of how they would grasp the freedoms that were given to them. Some of that grasping of freedoms was not all, um, as we all know, uh, not all altruistic and, and nationalist, but um, predatory. Um, and I think a lot of, uh, I, I mean, a lot of the story of what happened is he unleashed in his openness, unleashed, you know, the ability of government levels below him. Um, you know, to engage in behavior that ultimately undermine the coherence of any um, uh, Soviet authorities. So it's interesting, the question of, you know, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, whether it was really a, about the national, misunderstanding the nationalities just, or misunderstanding governance um, in, in the Soviet Union and the multiple levels of the Soviet Union. I just want to echo that. I think as the center grew older, and weaker, and there was more and more dynamism in, in, in remote areas, we saw all kinds of institutions be turned to be things that they hadn't been before, whether it was environmental movements that were really about independence or youth programs that were really about smallholder capitalism or what. So there was such a, a, an ability of people to move into the existing institutions and find a way to use that institutional power in an unexpected direction. Um, it, nationalities was a huge blind spot of Gorbachev's, but I think we, we were startled by the extent to which environmental movements weren't about environmentalism, um, by the extent to which youth movements were not about providing opportunity to the youth. I mean, all these institutions managed to become the levers that aspiring uh, leaders grabbed. Can't keep track of my own mute button. <laughs> I was saying, thank you, Terry. I think that that's uh, a really interesting answer. And it leads me to a very interesting question, which is uh, posed to us uh, by Juliana Forst, a uh, historian of the Soviet Union, who says that the collapse of the Soviet Union left a lot of the conversations happening during Perestroika unfinished. Which of the many unfinished conversations of Perestroika do you think have been the most consequential in the sense of leaving an absence of discussion? And I will throw one in there and then uh, go to Maria and Jill. I think that perhaps the conversation about what it meant for Russia to have been at the center of a Soviet empire, right? Because with Solzhenitsyn's writings, you know, I think Archipelago Gulag was like a sensation of early perestroika, but it was his later, you know, very statist sort of chauvinist writings um, that were starting to spark a discussion with Russian nationalists that probably didn't get finished. So my take, but Maria, yours. What a fascinating question. Thank you very much. So I only can touch upon very marginal elements of it, I think. Uh, two things. I just happened to finish a chapter uh, in the book about Russia's Asobe uh, Put special pathway, uh, trying to understand uh, how we ended up in this current trap 
Uh, and one of the chapters specifically covered uh, the debates during the perestroika period about Russia's direction. The interesting thing in the language uh, that you find about this time is that everything emphasized some sort of direction, a linear trajectory, which, and the question was for Russia, and the question was to what extent the Soviet period represented a part of this linear trajectory development, right? Which is the idea of progress or rather some sort of deviation and Russia is now getting back on this idea on this progress path where ultimately uh, the Russian uh, historical trajectory is viewed as part of the broader like civilizational Western uh, European at least uh, dynamic. We see over the years as I mentioned this vision of Russia's history has been completely modified, right? Right now, you rather see some sort of circle, right? Where Russia is effectively coming back. There is no linear direction. There is no progress. There's no any vision. There's no even attempt to debate about it, right? The, only, the consensus that emerged is that the Soviet times, pretty much the Brezhnev stagnation times, which is, this is the ideal vision of the past, but also of the one of the future. So interestingly, somehow over the years, probably because of the um, uh, shock that the society experienced uh, during the late 80s, early 90s, as well as definitely definitely its post-imperial syndrome uh, that it suffers from, uh, this uh, vision of Russia's trajectory completely changed as opposed to the perestroika times from a linear vision and Russia being part of the trajectory of the rest of the humanity into something uh, completely different, which I think is reflective also of uh, where it ended up being going back effectively. And the second point I wanted to mention uh, that I found interesting, I suspect this might have must have been the perestroika debate, uh, but I wanted to mention that uh, somebody who does not come from those times uh, following social media debate and discussions on um, uh, Gorbachev's death, I personally was shocked by how much agency is assigned to Gorbachev and Putin, for that matter, and how little agency is assigned to the society or anybody else, for that matter, frankly. Uh, this is not uh, how I, I used to see things, you know, being socialized into the US academia. And I'm actually shocked that society itself, right, as represented by these commentators, arguably maybe the best groups within the society, the liberals, the people who actually want to see some change, almost deliberately and linguistically abandon any, any some sort of their own agency. Um, and actually my perception, having read some of the historical debate, was that at the time, the reference to the society much, was much more pronounced uh, than it is today. Today, uh, many essentially accept that they have no agency whatsoever. And I frankly just don't think it's true. I think that uh, Putin does, uh, of course, uh, tries his best to lift agency for some groups of society, but then there is other groups that he actually tries to represent, right? So that sense, uh, it's a very different vision. And I think it's actually a much more productive vision uh, for the future to believe that uh, there is some sort of agency. But I think it's interesting because unfortunately it's also some sort of sad outcome of this recent uh, development of Russia. Um, maybe I'll jump in here, uh, Kelly. You know, I would go back to, it's a great question. I, I would go back to kind of what I raised when I was um, speaking at the top, uh, which is the Pakayania, the repentance. I think, you know, that because Russia didn't settle with its past, it began to, but it didn't fully do that, that the truth about what Stalin had done and the truth about you know, the price that the country paid for communism was never really fully talked about. And so, you know, maybe, I mean, Maria would know much better, but it, it just seems to me that because that d debate or discussion or atoning for what had happened or b understanding that, you know, your, your own family had suffered was never really fully carried out. And now under Putin, has, you know, history has been weaponized so that there is no way that you can really objectively or any other way discuss what, what um, Stalin did to the country. That, that that is such a truncate, truncated part of Russian history that it, it always, of course, raises the issue of, you know, the Germans and how they dealt with 
uh, Nazi Germany, et cetera. I don't know whether you know Russia could do that, but certainly the principle that you can say that bad things happened and they were bad for the country and we can atone for them and change it and go on. That never happened. And right now under Putin, I see no chance that that is going to happen. And the reverse is justifying some of the most egregious violations of human rights that came under the communists. So that's one thing I would raise. Well, Jill, you're you're preaching to the converted here because I still recall having finished my first book about remembering Stalin's victims and the role that had played during Perestroika. I thought my next book will be about transitional justice in Russia, but there was nothing to write about. I had to find a new topic. So, you know, I guess that's another missed conversation for me. Um, all right. We have two questions left that I'm going to try and squeeze in here um, in the 10 minutes or so we have left. Um, the first one is from David Beachley, uh, a very intriguing question. Um, and specifically, Angela Stanti, like your, your, your answer to this. Uh, he asks, can Gorbachev be considered a visionary populist in that he led the Russian people to a future that they needed and possibly subconsciously wanted, but had no ability to get there on their own? I think that's an interestingly framed question. It kind of echoes a little bit what Maria was just saying to us, that ideas about who had agency uh, in, in these tumultuous moments or, or today uh, remain really pertinent to how we try and understand Russia. But Angela, I'll give you a chance at that one. I think that's a difficult one. Honestly. It's a difficult question. And I was glad to see from the chat that he took a course with me my first semester at Georgetown, which was some time ago. <laughs> so thank you for listening in. So I think populist is an interesting term to um, apply to Gorbachev. I think he certainly did try an appeal to, to say, you know, I'm a man of the people, unlike all these other communist functionaries who live in their own world, who have all these privileges, uh, and I'm, I'm sort of more like one of you. You know, he did come from a peasant background, but then, of course, so did Khrushchev. But, you know, and he did have two grandfathers who were persecuted, who were in the gulag. Um, and so he, you know, I think he'd had a pretty tough uh, rural childhood. Um, and so he felt, and, and we've already, you know, talked also about Raisa, who I think um, herself, uh, you know, was very interested in the problems of those people living in those rural areas and studied them. So he did travel around the country. Um, of course, you hear different accounts of this. Some people will say, well, sure, he would show up to village X, but it wasn't exactly a Pachonkin village, but at least, you know, they'd assemble people. And even if they didn't tell them what questions to ask him, some of it was staged. So I think we, we have to understand that it wasn't all spontaneous, but still he was trying to, uh, you know, he was trying to appeal to them. And he did genuinely, I think, want to listen to people's complaints. He wanted to know what it was that was on people's minds because the other communist functionaries didn't care about that, weren't interested in that. So in that sense, again, I do think he wanted to, uh, to appeal to the people. Now, whether he represented something that they secretly all felt and he wanted to unleash forces uh, so that their desires would also be met, that's maybe a little bit more difficult to gauge, but clearly uh, there were people throughout that system who were fed up with all the kind of the petty corruption that existed in the Soviet period, not all petty, some more than that, people knowing you had to pay teachers bribes or doctors bribes or who, whatever you wanted done, you had to pay someone for it. So, and that's way it was way in contradiction to what the stated ideals of Marxism, Leninism were. So I think in that sense, he did appeal to, to some people's sort of raw nerves. But I, it also seems to me, and this was, was another problem, the idea that you unleash all of this and that there wasn't a plan. Um, I think that's also what he's criticized for today in Russia and even during the time then, because people are used to having, you know, what are considered to be strong leaders and people who have plans that they tell others about, whereas if you unleash glasnost uh, and, and things like that, you're telling people, you know, um, uh, you, you know, think what you want and come up with your own ideas. And so I think the ability to take the initiative there, to have the agency uh, that Maria was talking about, that was maybe a little bit more problematic. So that's rather a long-winded answer that, to say that there were, I think, elements of populism there, um, but it was complicated. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that's a very interesting, thoughtful answer. Um, I think the general tendency is to think of Yeltsin as the populist and not so much Gorbachev, but that's really a stylistic question, maybe more uh, than a sort of democratizing intent. All right, we have one question left, and I'm going to give Dean Hellman the first chance at this one. This comes from another series alum, uh, Alex Perez Reyes, and he starts by noting that many people compare the Soviet and Chinese experiences with reform and conclude that the recipe of economic but not political reform is more effective. Do you think this is fair when it sounds that as if uh, economic reforms were not very successful uh, in Russia, given the broader economic picture? Yeah, look, it's an interesting question. I don't really think, I, I, I generally understand the world where politics and economics are so deeply interconnected that there's really no such thing as economic reform without political reform or political reform without economic reform. It may not be democracy and market economy and cer certain types of reforms, but if you change the economic structure, you change the political structure, um, even if you maybe don't change the entire kind of uh, formation of the system. The, the big difference, of course, between um, China and Russia has to do with actually um, I, perhaps the the question that was raised earlier about the kind of the open the open conversation. Russia never really had a deep conversation about this the kind of restructuring it wanted. It just it 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 it, it launched a process that had no clear endpoint, and in the absence of an endpoint, it was a free for all. Um, and 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 so much of Russia's economic. Um, problems was a function of the fact that they they kind of opened things up economically while the old system was still functioning, um, uh, and that created opportunities for just enormous amounts of you know what what has been referred to by some scholars in the period as the grabbing hand, um, just everyone essentially feeding off the trough um, until there was very little left, and I think that it was the void created. Um, uh, from the economic discussion, there was there was no sense of 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 where we were we were moving to. Now that's not to say that the Chinese had a great sort of vision of what kind of economy they were going to create either, but they they allowed for a very very controlled opening. So they opened up things while maintaining sort of very tight controls on other parts of the system that certainly did not eliminate the feeding at the trough. And certainly China has had its share of it, um, but it didn't let get to kind of undermine, undermine the very roots um, uh, of the system and its ability to continue to function. So I really do think it's that the the real uh, the the real I, I think problem uh, that Gorbachev unleashed was this void of of economic uh, strategy and economic planning, and in that void. Um, uh, was this kind of grabbing on the one hand, and then this very kind of rote imitative, imitative form of market economics, which was really just kind of, you know, adopted whole hog from the West without much, you know, kind of engagement into what it meant for Russia. And I think that's really was the root um, of, of so many of the contemporary problems that Russia is facing today, because they, they still don't have that sense of what the vision of an economy can be. All right, I think that's the perfect note for us to end. I'll just say that uh, I think Mikhail Sergeyevich would be pleased that we remembered him by having a round table because if there was one thing that he liked, it was a good debate and to hear different opinions. And I think we've really achieved that today. So thank you to the participants and thank you to the audience and thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York uh, for their support for our series.